Man, y'all want to hear a funny story? This is, this is a good one. I, this is, I haven't pulled this one out for a while, so we're just going to dust it off a little bit because it's Christmas time and, and we need a laugh. It goes like this. Several men are in the locker room of a golf club. Cell phone on a bench rings and a man engages the hands-free speaker function and begins to talk. Everyone else in the room stops to listen. The man says, hello? And a woman's voice comes across the other line and says, hi, honey, it's me. Are you at the club? Yes, the man says. Well, I'm at the shops now and found this beautiful leather coat. It's only $2,000. Is it okay if I buy it? Sure. Go ahead, said the man, if you like it that much. The woman said, I also stopped by the Mercedes dealership and saw the new models. I saw one I really liked. Well, how much is it? $150,000, the woman replied. Okay, but for that price, I want it with all the options. Great. Oh, and one more thing, honey. I was just talking to Janie and found out that the house I wanted last year is back on the market. They're asking $2.2 million for it. Is that okay? Hmm. Well, go ahead and make an offer of $2 million. They'll probably take it, but if not, we can go the extra $200,000 if that's what you really want. Okay, I'll see you later. I love you so much. Bye. I love you too. The man hangs up. The other men in the locker room are staring at him in astonishment, mouths wide open. The man turns and asks, anyone know whose phone this is? <laughs> I love that story so much. It's just kind of the perfect story. And it's the perfect season for it. You know, Christmas is supposed to be the season of joy. And we say that and Hallmark has hijacked that and, and, you know, the stores have hijacked that. But that was actually God's original plan is that Christmas was uh, this, this season of new beginnings in a lot of way, uh, a season of the Lord doing something different, bringing new things that we lacked. And one of those things was joy. This is Luke chapter 2, verse 10. The angel speaking to the shepherds and says, Don't be afraid, the angel said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. That news was Jesus. Jesus is coming is supposed to bring joy into our lives, into the lives of every single person who receives him. But how many of y'all know that for a lot of us, Christmas isn't a joyous season? It can be a really irritating season. It can be a painful season for a lot of us. Some of us have lost loved ones over the years right around this season, have gone through traumatic, difficult times during this season. And Christmas can actually just become a a reminder of difficulties, right? But the, the Lord's heart in this season is that we would experience joy. How many of y'all know that, that Christmas is a little different as a kid versus as an adult? Adults, you know what I'm talking about? Right? Like, as a kid at Christmas, it was never stressful. You're just like, this is the best season of the year, right? But as an adult, things get a little bit complicated. There's things like family relationships to deal with. Okay, whose in-laws are we going to go spend Christmas at? They want us here. No, no, they want us here. Okay, we're going to go five minutes here and we'll do five. You know, it's just like all these things. Gifts become an issue. Like, are we going to draw names? Are we going to buy gifts for everybody? Like everybody? All these different things begin to come in and complicate it. Parents, you're like, okay, are my kids going to ruin Christmas again at grandma and grandpa's by bringing all the enthusiasm? That was a, that, that was a real fear for, for Sarah and I when we first had kids. Let's just say, anyone bring, uh, read the book by Dr. Dobson, Strong-Willed Child? Yeah, it, he talks about having one. I have five strong-willed children. Every single one of them. So it's like Christmas became this thing of joy, but also like, okay, this is a little stressful. Are kids going to behave? But as a child, Christmas is just simple. Essentially, it's just a time to be with people you love and most importantly, a time to get presents. Now, what's interesting is it's actually not that different with Jesus. In Mark chapter 10, verse 14, Jesus says this. It says, when Jesus saw what was happening, he was angry with his disciples. Why? His disciples had come across some kids that wanted to spend time with Jesus. And the disciples were like, Jesus doesn't like kids. Jesus is serious. There's no kids allowed, no enthusiasm, no childish ways allowed. You guys have to leave. Jesus catches wind of this and he gets ticked. He's mad at his disciples. And he says this, let the children come to me. Don't stop them. And he gives us a key to the kingdom of God here. 
This is so powerful. He says, for the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. I tell you the truth, anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. This is interesting. Jesus is like, look, I want to give you something, a gift. It's called the kingdom of God. The only way you can receive this gift is if you receive it like a kid receives a gift on Christmas Day, like a kid receives a present. How do kids receive gifts? I, I you know, maybe a lot of different ways, but I'll, I'll tell you my kids. You know, every time I come home from a trip, the first thing I'm greeted with is, what'd you get me, dad? And it's gotten so bad that even the dogs do it now. I'll walk through the front door and I'm dragging my suitcase. The dogs don't care about me. They come up and they start sniffing the suitcase. They're like, what did you bring me? Right? And so I'll, I'll sit all the kids down on the couch and I'm like, hey, close your eyes, put your hands out. So they'll close their eyes, put their hands out, and then I'll go through the suitcase and I take a really long time doing it. It's so fun. And then I'll put a gift in each of their hands. I'm like, hey, now you can open it. And they're just sitting there and they're all excited and they're expecting of what dad's going to get you know, give them. And, and when you think about a kid receiving a gift, there's really two main characteristics. The first one's excitement and the second one's trust. Here they are, right? Here's my kids. They're just excited. Like, what's going to come? But there's also this trust. Like, they're willing to close their eyes. I could put anything in their hands. But they're willing to close their eyes and trust, hey, dad's going to get me something that I'm going to like. He's going to give me a good gift. This is what James actually says in James chapter one, that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of heavenly life. It's like lights. Our, our Father gives us good gifts. Jesus will say, hey, you parents, how many of you, if your kid's hungry and ask for a hamburger, are going to give them a snake or a rock instead? It's my translation. He's like, no, you guys are a bunch of evil people, but you still know how to give good gifts to your kids. How much more will your heavenly Father give you a good gift, the Holy Spirit? Like, this is how a kid receives a gift. It's excitement, but it's also this trust. Now, I have to say, most times I have kept that trust with my kids, but there was one time. I just couldn't help myself. Uh, I, I bought Haley, my um, 16-year-old daughter now, but she was young at the time. I bought her a board game, and we're sitting down, and we're playing this board game, and I look down after we've finished the game, and I see on the side of the box that it says, for children eight years and older. And I'm like, oh, this is too good to pass up. I was like, Haley, do, do you see that box? Yeah, Dad. Do, do you see that number? What does that say? It says for kids eight years and older. And I was like, oh, no. That means that any kid that plays this game that isn't eight just broke the law. I was like, Haley, how old are you? She's like, I'm seven. I'm like, oh, baby. Guaranteed the police are on their way right now. You, you might have like a little time in jail. Mom and dad will try to scrape some money together for bail for you. At this point, she, like tears are coming down her eyes. And I'm just like, I'm the worst dad ever, but this was kind of the best at the same time. Like kids just have this trust. Like, hey, if dad's going to get me a gift, it's going to be a good gift. They're excited about it. And it's the same thing for us. God wants to give us joy but he says the way to receive it is like a kid. You have this expectation, this excitement, but you have this trust that even in the midst of difficult, complicated circumstances of life, and how many of y'all know we all have our own favorite flavor of difficulties, complications, and trials in this life? In the midst of that, I can trust that God still wants to give me something good. Thomas Aquinas once said, I thought this was so interesting, he said, no one can live without delight. And that is why a man deprived of spiritual joy goes over to carnal pleasures. It's like we were created to receive delight, pleasure, joy from our Heavenly Father. Those that don't know how to get it from Him turn to carnality to try to find it. Because it's what we've been actually created to experience. Now, joy is an interesting thing. Because there's a huge difference in, in how we receive joy much of what people will tell you is that joy has to be discovered. It's like you got to go looking for it. So like if you're in a circumstance or situation, maybe a relationship or a job, and there's no joy in it, you're not finding pleasure, you're not finding happiness, then you need to leave where you are, leave that relationship, go to a different one where you can actually discover joy. Leave that job, go somewhere where you can discover it. Leave that situation and go somewhere where you can actually discover joy. Scripture does not teach us that you can discover joy. What Scripture 
scripture teaches us is that you can actually develop joy in your life. And there's a huge difference. This is James chapter one, verse two, maybe one of the most famous verses, at least in the New Testament on joy. He says this, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. He's, he's describing a situation where it's just like trials all around. And this wasn't like, oh, Starbucks made, you know, made my drink too cold. This was like, I'm being thrown in prison. I'm suffering. I'm having hardships with my family. These are like trials of many different kinds that they're experiencing. And James doesn't say, just try to you know, look on the bright side. Just look around. It's like, there's nowhere to discover joy in the midst of this trial. Where I'm at, there's none to be found. What he says is, consider it. I want you to think different. I want you to engage your mind, your heart, your emotions, your will, make a choice to think about your circumstances differently. And in doing so, you're actually going to develop joy in the midst of this joyless circumstance. This is what we're going to look at today. How do we, as Christians, begin to, de- to use the biblical tools God has given us to develop joy in our lives? I want to give you the first key, and this honestly may be the most important thing I say all morning. And it's this, the first key to developing joy is actually being okay with joyless moments. It's learning to be okay with unhappy moments and seasons in your life. There's a pressure upon us, maybe greater than any other generation, to feel happy, to feel pleasure at every single moment in our day, in our week, in our months, in our year. A lot of it has come about because of social media, and everybody poo-poos social media, and probably rightfully so. I think it's stupid. But, you know, in social media, what happens? For the most part, all you're seeing is people's happy moments. You're seeing these, like, moments of pleasure. Now, not always. Things have begun to shift. People are posting sad things. Be Real's kind of helped, but not even. I watch my kids do Be Real. I'm like, that's not real. But for the most part, we're seeing these extreme moments of happiness and pleasure in everybody's lives. And what that's communicating to us is, well, everybody else is happy, and it seems like they're happy all the time. So if I'm having a moment of unhappiness or displeasure, then something must be wrong. Then I got to change something in my life so that I can live like that, so that I can have that happiness, so that I can have that pleasure. Some will go so far as saying, well, there must be something wrong with me if I'm not experiencing that type of happiness and pleasure in every moment of my day. How many of y'all know that the biblical example, like the characters in Scripture, had many, many moments of unhappiness? Think about the Apostle Paul. I mean, he lists all his moments of unhappiness. You guys remember that? He's like, I've been beaten this many times. I've been flogged this many times. I've been shipwrecked this many times. There is one moment where he says, I despaired of life itself. Does that sound like a joy-filled circumstance? No, it sounds like the dude was depressed. You look at Jesus in Isaiah 53, which is a messianic prophecy about the coming of Christ and the crucifixion of Jesus, what he would accomplish for us on the cross. And it says that he was a man acquainted with sorrows and grief. Jesus in the Gospels wept on many occasions. He cried when his friend Lazarus died. He cried over Jerusalem because they were so stubborn and they were causing so much pain and destruction. It's like he was someone that knew what sorrow was like. His life was not one of continuous moments of joy, happiness, and pleasure. And for some of us, the first key, honestly, to learning how to develop joy in our lives is just being okay with moments of unhappiness. Uh, A few years ago, maybe three or four years ago, Sarah and I pretty much hit the roughest year of our marriage. First year of marriage was a breeze. It was, I shouldn't say it was a breeze, but it was pretty good. We got to year like 15 or 16 and it was like, what just hit the fan? Like, this is different. This is hard. And there was things that kept coming up over and over and over again throughout the years that we just could not figure out how to resolve things where we would be hurting each other, saying things, and we're just like, we love each other, but this is really, really difficult. And every time we get into one of those, um, they weren't fights. They were intense moments of fellowship, as one person likes to call them. Those moments, it's interesting because I, we found ourselves like trying to fix it, trying to escape that uncomfortability as quickly as possible. 
So something would come, and she's like, oh, okay, what do we do? I'm, I'm just say sorry, you say sorry. We just, we're just going to fix this. We're just going to figure it out. But it never worked. And I remember one day in particular, we were in that moment, and I just felt like a whisper from the Lord, and I felt like he said, sit in it. I was like, sit in it? What do you mean, sit in it? Don't try to fix it. Just sit in it. Admit what you're feeling. Admit what she's feeling. Receive it, and just sit there and do nothing in that moment of uncomfortability, of hurt, of anger, of sadness. Just sit in it. So we were just like, okay. And we just took a deep breath and we just sat there. We didn't try to fix it. And it was really uncomfortable. But something amazing happened in that moment. As we chose not to frantically run away or frantically try to fix it, we just sat there. And in that moment, the grace of God came in in a way that it had never had before. It was amazing. It's almost as if God was saying, every time this has come up, my grace has been available but you're moving too quick. You're, you're so unwilling to have a moment of unhappiness and uncomfortability that you're actually running from my grace because my grace is found right smack in the middle of it. Does that make sense? And for some of us, it's like, if we're going to learn to develop joy in our lives, we just have to be okay with moments and even seasons of unhappiness, of a life that doesn't have a lot of pleasure in this moment or that season. And that's okay. And I'll tell you why it's okay. Oftentimes, the greatest discipleship that God will cause to happen in your life is in moments of difficulty and displeasure. Uh, Think about it like this. Let's say one day you wake up, look in the mirror, and you're just like, I'm actually a jerk. Like, I love Jesus, but I really don't like people, and I tend to be really mean to people, And I know Jesus wants me to love him. So you pray this prayer. You're like, Jesus, teach me how to love people. Can you just help me love people better? You know how he's going to help you love people better? I guarantee this will happen. That day, he's going to bring someone who's really difficult to love right across your path. And he's going, okay, go practice. And you're like, I'm pretty sure I didn't sign up for the honors class, Jesus. Like, this is a little too much. A little too much. Give me a nice, like a better person, Jesus. How do you learn how to love? By having to deal with unlovable people. How do you learn how to have peace? By being thrown into a storm with Jesus, right? It's all these things. And so when God is maturing us and discipling us, oftentimes, if I can just be really frank and honest, a lot of you are immature disciples of Jesus because you run away from trials, because you run away from unhappy seasons, instead of just sitting in it long enough to allow the grace of God to come in to do the work that he wants to do in your life. I'm guilty of it. I do it all the time. But if we're going to learn to grow and mature, if we're going to learn to actually develop this, this resilient joy in our life that Jesus came, lived a perfect life, died on the cross to actually give us, we're going to have to learn just to sit in it for a little bit. Now, there's two more keys we're going to look at if we have time. Both come from an Old Testament story found in Nehemiah chapter 8. This is really intriguing to me. In Nehemiah, uh, it's the story, if you remember, of of Israel. This is also the book of Ezra. Israel uh, under captivity uh, uh, in Babylon, but Cyrus, king of the Persians, comes in, takes over, and he releases the Israelites to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, rebuild the city, rebuild the wall. So under Nehemiah, they're rebuilding all that stuff, especially the walls, and it gets to this point when they're done, and the people come to Ezra, and they say, Ezra, you got to teach us the law of Moses. Like, you need to read this to us. Because essentially, in the exile, when they were away from Jerusalem, they'd kind of all forgotten about the law. And essentially, what they're saying was, look, we don't want to go through the exile again. We want to be obedient to God. So, like, tell us what he expects. Can you read the law? So, this amazing thing happened. The whole country, all who were there, from the kids all the way to the elders, are standing from about 6 o'clock in the morning till noon, listening as Nehemiah and Ezra and the Levites are reading out the law of Moses, most likely the book of Deuteronomy and some of the others. And as it's being read out, the Levites are like running around milling 
among the crowds explaining and interpreting the law of God to them. This is what this means. This is how it actually applies to your life. This is what you're going to do. This is how you celebrate the Feast of Booths. This is how you do this. They're just like working it into the culture. Now, they get done. It's lunchtime. Everyone's hot. Everyone's hungry. And then the people begin to respond to what they've just heard. And it says that as a whole nation, they just begin weeping. They're just like bawling their eyes out as they've just sat under the word of God. And essentially what happened was, is as they heard the law of Moses read to them, they go, here's what God expects us of. Here's, way up here is his standard. And they began looking at their lives and the reality of how they had been living and how they're currently living. They're like, we are way down here. And they're like, this gap is too far. What are we going to do? And they just begin repenting and mourning as a whole nation. Now, this is like an evangelist dream, right? Like these dudes hadn't even preached. All they did is got up and read like Leviticus. And then the spirit of weeping and repentance falls on the crowd. The evangelist is like, I'm amazing, you know? But what's fascinating is God doesn't go, great, that's what I wanted for them. I just want them to weep. I want them to repent. God actually tells them to stop weeping and to start celebrating. So let's look at verse 8 together. This is Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8. They read from the book of the law of God and clearly explained the meaning of what was being read, helping the people understand each passage. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who were interpreting for the people said to them, don't mourn or weep on such a day as this, for today is a sacred day before the Lord your God. For the people had all been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Now, it'll go on. And essentially what happens is the Holy Spirit speaks to Nehemiah, to Ezra, and says, tell all the people to stop crying. What? No, you got to tell them to stop crying right now. This day is special. This day is set apart. This day is holy. And now Nehemiah and Ezra have kind of a problem. They go, how do I move this entire nation from a place of despair, hopelessness, mourning, crying, into a place of celebration and joy. Because what God essentially told them was, this day is a day to celebrate, not a day to mourn. So now they're going, how do I shift the culture and actually help these people develop joy right now in this moment? And this is how they do it. They look at them, and essentially they say, stop it. Go get a sheep, a lamb, a fattened calf, whatever you got, Go get some wine. Go get some bread. It's time to celebrate. And they literally just say, stop crying. Go and celebrate. And you look at this and you're just kind of like, what? That doesn't seem very authentic. Because essentially what Nehemiah was saying was, fake it till you make it. God wants your hearts light and happy. How are you going to get there? Just start celebrating. I don't feel like celebrating. Just do it anyways. This is actually a key to developing joy in your life. When you're in a moment, when you're in a season, when you don't feel joy-filled, how do you get joy-filled? You celebrate. You celebrate what God has just accomplished in your life. David did the same thing when David became king. And actually towards the latter part of his reign before he was going to hand over the kingdom to his son Solomon, he set up this whole system of prayer and worship. Many think 24-hour prayer and worship in the tabernacle. And part of what he did is he called entire families and said, okay, this is, this is your time slot. Like 2 a.m. in the morning to 3 a.m. in the morning, your family, your job is just to go up and give thanks to God. Well, what if we don't feel like giving thanks? I mean, who in their right mind feels like giving thanks at 2 o'clock in the morning? Doesn't matter. Just do it. Just get in there and start giving thanks. Well, David, what do you want us to give thanks about? He's like, I don't care. Pick anything. You can go back and be like, well, Thanks, God, for, you know, releasing our ancestors from Egypt and bringing Israel into the promised land. Great. He's like, just pick something, and I want you to give thanks for it. And I'm like, well, that just, that feels, that feels a little hollow. That doesn't feel like the real thing. Now, here's the interesting thing. David essentially says, I want you to cultivate a thankful heart by simply giving thanks. And when the Levites and the priests and those families would just simply go through the motion of celebrating and thanking God when they would line up their minds, their emotions, a physical act of speaking these things out. 
in obedience to what David and God had commanded them to do, something on the inside would begin to change. It's the same thing that happened for the Israelites under Nehemiah. Nehemiah is like, just give thanks, start celebrating. I want you to put your guts into it. Go slaughter some animals, have a barbecue. Let's have a feast. And as they went through that motion of obedience, even though they weren't feeling it, they began to feel it. Does this make sense? There's something amazing that happens out of simple obedience. The same thing happens with joy. We can actually rejoice our way into joy. And you're like, well, isn't that phony? It's actually phony if you don't. Some of you guys call yourself a believer, but you only do what you feel. How many of y'all know that's not what a believer does? A believer acts in obedience out of faith. Much of the Christian life is doing what you don't feel because you have a king who told you to do something. And oftentimes, as you walk in obedience to what the king said, your emotions will catch up. And when we're developing joy in difficult circumstances, whatever those circumstances might be, when we're developing joy in a season where we just don't feel joyful, we obey our king and we let our emotions catch up. We see Jesus doing this. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. It says, Fix your eyes on Jesus, the pioneer, the perfecter of faith. And it says this, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. How many of y'all know Jesus did not find any joy in the nails being driven through his hand? Like if he was on a search to discover joy, he was not going to find it. But he knew that there was joy set before him. On the other side of the cross, there was joy. What is that? What he found joy in is the guaranteed outcome of the event. He knew because his father had promised. You go through this season, you walk through this moment of unhappiness, and there is a guarantee of great joy, a great fulfillment of promise on the other side, the salvation of the world. The glorification of Jesus back to the right hand of the Father. All these things. Sometimes when we're celebrating, when we're faking it, we may not find joy right then in the moment, but we're looking to the promised, guaranteed outcome of our obedience to God. I mean, how many of all love fasting? Fasting sucks. I mean, let's just be honest. It's terrible. And, you know, every year we do 21 days of prayer and fasting. And almost every year... I don't feel the joy. I don't see the breakthrough while I'm fasting, but I will see it afterwards. I'm in that moment going, this isn't very happy or pleasurable, but there's this guaranteed outcome. In faith, there's a joy set before me. And when we celebrate, even though we're not feeling it, oftentimes that's exactly what we're doing. We're doing it in faith, believing that God will come through with his word. Now there's a second key from Nehemiah that we see. It's found in verse 10. It goes like this. And Nehemiah continued, go and celebrate with a feast of rich foods and sweet drinks. And here's the key. He says, and share gifts of food with people who have nothing prepared. This is a sacred day before our Lord. Don't be dejected and sad for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And the Levites too quieted the people telling them, hush, don't weep for this is a sacred day. So the people went away to eat and drink at a festive meal to share gifts of food and to celebrate with great joy because they had heard God's words and understood them. This is interesting. This is kind of a frustrating assignment when you really think about it. When the last thing that you feel like doing is being happy, you receive this assignment from God through the mouth of of Nehemiah to go make sure everybody else is happy. Isn't this interesting? I mean, how many of you, when you're unhappy... Okay, you're like, you know what I just want to do right now? I just want to go out of my way to make other people happy. Like that would just be great. I'm so unhappy right now that I just really want to focus on other people and give all my effort, maybe even give some money. I just want to find some other person to make happy. That's not how I feel. When I'm in that depths of a joyless situation, guess who I'm thinking about? Me. And Nehemiah gives us this key. I'm telling you, we're not talking about discovering joy. We're talking about developing joy. You want to do it? It's going to take some work, but it's there for you to have. Nehemiah is essentially saying, look, put your energy into making others happy. Don't put your energy in trying to make yourself happy. It won't work. Put your energy. If you want to develop joy in your life, especially in a difficult season, you got to put energy into making other people happy. Nehemiah is like, okay, here's what I want you to do. 
I know you're still crying. Dry those eyes, you big baby. I want you to go, and, and if you've got meat and somebody else doesn't, go find someone that doesn't, and I want you to give them meat. If you've got extra wine, go give them the wine. I want you to go and prepare a feast for somebody else and not just yourself. Why? Because the Lord knows, Nehemiah knew that when you can get an entire people group to take their eyes off of simply pleasing themselves in a moment of despair and unhappiness, if you can shift their eyes to other people, to focus on somebody else's happiness, they'll get happy in the process. Why? It's how God created us. That's why he says he loves joyful givers. How do you get joyful in giving when you don't want to give? You give. Because in the giving, it produces joy. Why? Because now your eyes are shifted off of yourself to others. It's, it, I'm telling you, this works. It frustrates me. Because usually my unhappiest, grumpiest moments are either Sunday afternoon, right when I'm done preaching, or Monday morning, if it's been a really big weekend. And during those moments, I'm just like, everybody leave me alone, just leave. Can everyone just leave right now? I want to focus on me. I don't want to be bothered. Don't ask me anything. Don't t- I don't care if you want to play a game with dad, just leave. You know, just like, that's where I'm at. And it's so frustrating because when I try to make myself happy, I never get happy. But those moments where I will just give up and I'll just go, okay, I'm just going to play the stupid board game or I'm going to go do the chores that I know I need to because it's going to serve my family or whatever it is. I'll be complaining. I'll be holding grudges. But in the process of just shifting my eyes from myself to somebody else, it's amazing how the joy comes. And I'm kind of just kind of like, what happened? Lord, can we just bring the joy by me focusing on me? (laughs) Nope. Nehemiah says, go prepare a feast for the people around you. Spend your energy on trying to make other people happy. I want to leave us with two things as we conclude. The first is this. I want you to write down today three things to celebrate. I'm not going to say this week. Don't put it off. You'll forget. I'll forget. Today, before the sun sets, I want you to write down, maybe it's just texting somebody, but three things that you're thankful for, three things to celebrate that God has done in your life. You're like, this sounds so childish. This sounds so simple. It is simple. It is childish. That's what Jesus said. And aren't you glad that Jesus made it relatively simple to develop joy in your life? I want you to write down just three things. Here's the second thing, and it's this. It's a question. Who are you going to make happy today? I want you to pick one person that you're going to try to make happy. One person who's going to help you shift your attention off of yourself and your own joy. One person. I want you to get creative. Not just like, oh, I'm going to try to make them happy. Get specific. How are you going to make them happy? What are you going to do for them? Maybe it's just an encouraging word. Maybe it's doing their chore. (laughs) even though it's their chore day. You know, what, you get creative, but find some way. We're like, what am I going to do to make that one person happy today? Now, this is self-seeking. I'm going to admit it. This is self-seeking. Because what you're doing is practicing. You're learning how to actually develop a lifestyle of joy. For some of you, it's a difficult day, difficult season. Maybe you're in that season of like, this is really hard. For others of you, it's like, I'm great. Even if you're great, how many of y'all know it's easier to learn something when life is going great than when it's in the trenches? You're going to develop it today. Who's the person you're going to try to make happy? What are the three things that you're going to celebrate today? Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your word. First and foremost, we just celebrate you, Jesus. Thank you for coming. Thanks for, for dying for us, Jesus, for forgiving us of our sins for making a way for us to to go to heaven, for making a way for us to have relationship with our Father. We're just so grateful, Lord. And Father, I just pray, Holy Spirit, would you come in great power upon each and every one of us that there would be a, a creativity that comes on us of how we can serve the people around us, make them happy, that there would be a spirit of celebration and joy that falls on us this season. And I pray it now in Jesus' name. Amen.